Yeah, check this out. Look at him in a jacket. Oh, fancy oh. pants. Woo! Are you at the oh. Institute of Directors, Johnny? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'll see you there, lads. Uh, oh, that is just... Oh, I recognise that. Well, I'm going there in about two hours' time, so... I'll be in my little room. Yeah, I'll avoid that. Your cell. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sharing a video, Mr. Kirby? Lindsay Warren has just said, this is already the best webinar I've been on this year. <laughs> Where the hell have you been? We're in March. <laughs> yeah, I'm also in this too already. <laughs> I love the fact. I love the fact that Paul's managed to blame his technological incompetence on bad Wi-Fi as well. Like he's just given himself, a, <laughs> like a, it's like a cloak of protectiveness. Absolutely. Yeah. I think he's faking his voice. He's just going, "I can't possibly do it." <laughs> I, uh, it at all. It just keep dropping out. Terrible. Okay, someone, someone mute him. Is really not. That's the most <laughs> sense he's made all year. <laughs> Oh dear. Choose life. Choose a car. Choose an electric car. Choose an electric van. Choose to clear your diary for an hour of the day to listen to industry experts. Choose wind. Choose solar. Whatever you choose, choose not to burn stuff. Choose collaboration. Choose sustainable transport solutions. Choose a fixed rate renewable energy tariff and a meat free diet. Choose net zero by 2050. Choose switching to electric and wondering why it's taking you so long. Choose knowledge. Choose laughter. Choose your friends. Choose your regular hit of the EV Cafe webinar. Choose relaxing on your couch listening to game-changing, thought-provoking intellectuals that actually know what they're talking about. Choose sipping a brew at the end of it all, safe in the knowledge that you now know better than to listen to the waffle fed Bob and Karen on Facebook. Choose the EV Cafe. There is a weird great box. It's our favourite part of the month. We get to open the digital doors to our wonderful EV cafe. However, today I'm broadcasting live from London Institute of Directors and not the JB Cafe Central Head Office. <laughs> I've always known as my home. Certainly makes for a nice change. Um, so my name is Johnny Berry and I'm the Chief Barista for today at the EV Cafe. However, in my day job, I'm the Head of Decarbonisation from Laguna Vehicle Solutions, formerly known as um, Hitachi Capital Vehicle Solutions. Um, on behalf of the whole EV Cafe crew, I'd like to warmly welcome you to the EV Cafe. Although at 18 degrees in London today, I think things are already hotting up. Um, I hope you've all got yourself a perfectly sourced sustainability cupped you could say mugged, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking of mugs. Hello, JC. <laughs> anyway, as I was saying, I hope you all have a freshly brewed coffee in your hand because for the next hour, we're going to chat about inclusive mobility because everyone should have access to uh, electric vehicles and, of course, charging them. No one should be left behind or stopped from doing the right thing. So I really hope you do enjoy the topics of today as much as we love bringing it together for you. And we only like doing this because of you, our lovely audience. So please do get stuck in with your comments and questions. This is your place as, as it is ours. So on that, uh, Sarah, what do we have on the menu for today? Oh, what a menu. I've been waiting for this one for so long. So this is about making sure that everyone understands what inclusive mobility means. So we've brought some experts. We've got Claire Pennington from Urban Foresight, Jan Turner from Plymouth City Council, and also we're bringing news from Motability and Motability Operations from the research that we've been doing before the show. So I don't think that we could get a better set on today. And we just want to make sure that everybody's aware if you're a policymaker, if you're a doer, a person installing infrastructure, wherever you fit, in this decision-making process and rollout of kit, we just need to make sure that you are thinking about everyone. And please start using that hashtag as well, hashtag inclusive mobility. It's a really hot topic. Can't escape it at the moment. This is a really important one. Hello. What's happened? <laughs> did, I, did I kill everyone? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think what I said was that bad. PK, over to you. 
Oh, over to me now. Right, good stuff. Well, you clearly um, didn't read the agenda this morning, <laughs> did you? <laughs> I was expecting you to steer the ship, Johnny, just as you're normally you normally steer. But if you wish to go hands-free, that's fine. For um, those of us who are new to the EV Cafe, we do actually script this thing to a point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's very, very loose. Um, so, so thank you to our sponsors, Paul. We wouldn't be, I know what to talk about, Johnny. Thank you. <laughs> um, um, what I get the privilege and pleasure of doing is celebrating the lovely people who make all of this possible. So as you can see from our backdrop here that we are sponsored by the wonderful My Energy. My Energy, a provider of home uh, charging and uh, well, in, in all kinds of charging actually, but they, they particularly interact with uh, other things like solar and it really help you manage effectively a cracking business um, and a UK business at that. And that's great news. Uh, Geotab, we are also sponsored by the lovely Geotab. And I'm actually here at one of their resellers today, uh, Motormax up in the Midlands, uh, talking about how they use data to bring insight to help fleet managers make the transition to electric vehicles, which is fantastic news. They happen to be the biggest telematics company in the world. There you go. Um, and also sponsored by the AA, providing power to electric drivers. And also, um, you know, in the background, helping people make charging happen at the point of charging. So that's really good. <laughs> supporting, <laughs> supporting lots of people. Anyway, um, over to, I don't know, John Curtis or somebody. <laughs> no, it's me, Paul, because I read the agenda and it's me next. Um, good. You but, jump uh, right in, Sam. Yeah, my, mine's going to be very brief. Hello, everyone. Um, my name's Sam Clark. I'm the Chief Vehicle Officer for GridServe Sustainable Energy in my day job. Um, I'm based uh, at home normally, but I'm in the Ivor offices today in, in, in West London. Um, my job, really digital housekeeping, just to look after uh, our guests and do introductions and make sure that we keep to time a little bit in that regard. And um, looking forward to today's discussion around accessibility because as a representative of a charge point operator or CPO. Um, this is obviously something that's incredibly important to what we do at GridServe, but what we do for, for the wider public and the wider industry across all different companies in the public realm in regards to charging infrastructure. So looking forward to the debate today. Uh, and with that, I shall pass over to Mr. Curtis. Goodness gracious, he's even read that script. Um, John Curtis. <clears throat> well, if you like me and what I do today, I'm John Curtis. If you hate me and think what a donut, then I'm Paul Kirby. Um, today, my job is to look after the mailroom. So essentially, if you ask questions, I'll put them to our guests. At the bottom of the screen, you will see there is a Q&A tab. Hit the Q&A tab if you have a question for our guests, and I will pose that question to our guests later on in the webinar. The best question could win an EV Cafe mug. Show's mug doesn't have one. Uh, so <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Well done, darling. Uh, so I yes. uses few, but I have them. Oh, yes. An EV Cafe mug. There we are. So you can get one of those if you ask a jolly good question. So fire them into the Q&A thing at the bottom. Uh, the chat box on the right hand side is for general malarkey and nonsense. And Sarah will keep track of that. And without further ado, shall we start? Because inclusivity means different things to different people, perhaps. And so I wanted to start with a question. And that question is, um, Sarah. What's your starting point in terms of, of inclusive charging and mobility? Where do you start this debate? Because I'm hoping that as we hear from our guests and speakers, we may develop our own thinking. So where do you start? I have a really, wow, did you just spotlight me? I really don't like it when you do that. It freaks me out. The way. <laughs> yeah. I think you just have to start from the point of view that everybody in this industry has a chance to make a difference on this, whether you're a policymaker, a town planner, or somebody who's procuring uh, a service to make sure that what you're building in your town or city or urban space or rural space is accessible for all. So for me, I think the starting point is realizing that we've never had a better opportunity. There's a lot of legacy kit out there that wasn't aware of these issues when they were put in. 
But now we have grants, now we have funding, now we know what we're doing, now we have trials, now we have fantastic organisations who are out there to help bring guidance and measurements to us. I know I work for MER, I'm the head of speech and mobility partners at Eltronics who were recently acquired by MER, and I was really pleased to see that they took great detail with a report that I was reading last night. And it concluded with some perfect heights for AC equipment, perfect heights for card readers, perfect distances between bollards. So it's not hard, it can be done, and reaching out to the network as we are today to gather people's willingness to feedback is actually really crucial because people don't do things wrong to be lazy or stupid or to waste money. They probably just didn't know in the first place. I've yeah. been in infrastructure of nearly a scary amount of years. This isn't dyed grey hair, it's very old grey hair. And it's because this stuff matters and it takes a really long time to measure, plan and do. And I think that's the key is making sure that along all of those steps of the way, consultation, both out in the market, but also internally within internal teams in local authorities or planners or people who have acquired the, abil the ability to install EV charging. So I found a really cool diagram, actually, let me just get it for you, you might have spied it a minute ago. So I'm going to just slightly move out of the way. So there you go, you saw some measurements there, and this was a trial that we did, that Mer did in partnership with um, Durham County Council, so <laughs> for that and they made sure they had multiple users testing it and they had the dummy chargers and move the pillars around and move the height up and down so that we could gather from the group the optimum height so i'll put the conclusion in the chat and i'll share it after the show so in an ac world it is quite easy to do this there's lots of products coming to market products that don't even need those car parking barriers, which are one of the biggest problems once you've got out of your vehicle, even if you make a huge space for your vehicle, it may be that the user can't actually plug in the cable very easily without having to have an overreach with their arm, or perhaps the screen is too high, or they can't see the information displayed clearly on the screen, if it's even got a screen. So there was clever innovation around putting the instructions on the side of the unit rather than on the front. If you can't get to the front, you're not going to be able to read what to do. So it's just putting yourself in someone else's shoes and realizing how, you know, potentially easy it is for you, but not for somebody else. And um, I know Sam is going to cover some of the DC stuff, but I do have an amazing quote from Jonathan, who's on the call, Jonathan Jenkins from Motability Operations. He was saying that by 2035, there could be 1.3 million drivers with a disability. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. So for up to 50% of 1.3 million of all drivers or passengers who will have a disability, this is estimated at 2.7 million people. So these are people who are going to be partially or wholly reliant on public charging infrastructure. So that actually came from Motability, but um, Jonathan works as the head of innovation at Motability Operations. So thank you for sharing that. And they've done some huge studies around um, a staggering 24.6% of households don't have access to off-street parking. So this isn't a minority issue. This is about growing huge networks, hopefully all underpinned by renewable energy as well. So if we can get it underpinned by renewable energy, fully accessible and functioning charging at a fair and accessible price, then surely e-mobility is the only way to go. There's no looking back. Thank you, Sarah. That's a very comprehensive answer. And I, and I think what you've done is in my head, I'm now thinking, how would I be if I had to try and charge a vehicle or indeed fill a petrol or diesel vehicle from a wheelchair? How easy would that be? And it must be extremely challenging. And I think maybe what we could do is go out and try it, try to do it. Live that journey. Just a thought. Sam, what's your starting point, darling? Yeah, well, interestingly, my starting point was a, a point of, of not having any real knowledge in this particular space, I'm ashamed mm. to say. So I think when this subject came up as one we were going to discuss on the EV Cafe, I went away and did some homework from, from the Gridsurf perspective, because I certainly didn't know enough about, about this particular challenge. And, and I kind of break it down in the DC world to, to a couple of, couple of um, topics, really. One which, um, and again, there's a slight overlap here with what Sasa said, but there's the legacy stuff, and then there's the, there's the new build stuff. So um, new sites are, are easier, of course, because we can we can do access audits. We can take into consideration the DDA, the, the which is the Disability, Disability Discrimination Act, and start to look at the way in which we, we which we uh, we place charges in the ground. And like Sarah, I'm going to pop a pop another background on, which I, hopefully you guys can see there, uh, which is how we we're looking to approach a lot of our new hubs to make sure that they are indeed mm -hmm. 
um, accessible, and that includes the things that Sarah mentioned about terminal height and uh, location of the charger, is it accessible to all users? Um, you know, the sixth space, as we've got there, as you can see illustrated, you know, the, the, the typical charging bay is 4.8 meters by 2.5. An accessible bay can be up to six by, meters by 4.8. So they're significantly larger, which in itself creates certain challenges when it comes to putting stuff into the ground. Um, and standard bays aren't designed to accommodate long wheelbase commercial vehicles either. So, so we need to be able to think about ways in which we make these bays um, accessible to all. Um, which perhaps is another another area which we need to discuss. You know, I've got another screen grab here around, so you can see it, not screen grab, sorry, background. So you can see the, the, the physical difference between the sizes of those two bays. And I've deliberately moved and removed actually from this particular drawing, um, the disabled bay icon, because I think that's another thing to discuss around what, what, what sh should that bay be for? Is it for accessibility for all? Is it specifically for disability or mobility and uh, restricted? individuals and therefore that precludes the ability to put it for commercial charging so i think that's a another debate to consider mm. um, and obviously our electric forecourts are all covered uh, they're manned they're accessible so that they're, they're a lot easier for people to be able to to utilize but that doesn't take into consideration um the the uh, the legacy stuff which is where i think there's a lot of challenges um so um on existing sites, you know, we still need to have a reality and reality check and, and potentially retrofit legacy spaces across places that they're already um, featured. So a lot of the bays aren't large enough for accessible provision at the moment. Um, landlords are unlikely to allow commercial vehicles to maneuver in tight spaces. So that's, that's already a challenge because the, the charging bays are already in, in proximity, they're already in the ground. Um, the charging bays require relinquishing standard bays to accommodate larger bays. So that's another thing we've got to consider because if you have these much larger accessible bays, you're ultimately reducing the number of charging, uh, sorry, the number of car park spaces, which in its own right might uh, breach certain planning conditions whereby certain landlords will have a, a requirement to, be, to provide a certain amount of parking bays within a car park. So just making the bays bigger isn't, isn't necessarily uh, that easy. Um, OEMs, we've got different sockets in different places. We've got to think about that front left, front back, back left, you know, they're all over the place. So how do we, how do we try and mitigate that issue? Heavy cables, we've got to think about that. Now, a lot of our, in fact, let me just switch onto one more backdrop. Um, this is our Swansea, Swansea Bay. The cables are incredibly heavy, but these are our 350 kilowatt chargers in our Swansea hub, but they're on pulleys. So although they're very heavy water cooled cables, the lot of the weight is taken into consideration by virtue of having it, having it on a pulley system to, to, to manage that. Uh, we've got to look at color distinction, you know, with the, we've got teal and white to make the contrast as clear as possible. Um, what else is there? Coverings, obviously that's hugely expensive and also requires a tremendous amount of additional planning. So it's not just, can't just you put a cover on for people, that, that's not that easy either. Uh, and the last point I'm gonna make around accessibility is that a lot of the time we get asked to put accessible bays or even, even hubs at the far point of a car park because that's where the greatest amount of space and flexibility is. And that's all well and good, but we've got to then consider how does that access that that um, person access might be able to access the chargers. We can, as you can see in the background behind me, we removed all curbs, so there's no curbs to go under. We, you can go wheelchair access, can go through the bump stops, can get through the bollards, can get access to the uh, the connectors and the and the cable because they're all at the right and correct height to do so. But what you can't see in this picture is how far away it may be from the amenities, and how do we get people from this location safely to the amenities which might be on the opposite side of the of the car park so we've got a duty of care to think about well we might be able to sort all this stuff in my background but what about the people what, what do they do then where do they go then and have we got to then consider other restrictions as well so i, th I just wanted to sort of highlight some of the some of the sort of um, legacy driven challenges that we've got to try and make existing infrastructure accessible as well as having uh, a good provision of consideration uh, for the new stuff that's going in. Um, so that was my, my two pence worth, which I've, I've regurgitated and plagiarized from my colleagues in, in the origination and planning department. They actually know what they're talking about, but, but hopefully it's, it's useful um, to, to prompt some debate. Because it is important. Now, there are some comments, Bill N in the chat box, and I don't usually look at the chat box too much, but it says it's very disappointing that somehow we've got to a point with 30,000 charge points already installed, and this kind of stuff is only now being considered. It's mind boggling, really. And, and I have a lot of sympathy with that. 
Yeah, I mean, it's not wrong, but it's it's an easy thing to say. I mean, we, we were on a huge journey here with, with EV charging, and, and it wasn't that many years ago where we were putting three point three pin plug sockets into into charge posts at motorway service areas. You know, now we've got five hundred high powered chargers in the ground. You know, we were going through a huge journey here, and 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 anyone that was thinking, oh well, well we put in that three pin socket at three kilowatts 10 years ago we've also got to put vehicle uh, van traffic bays in we've got to put disabled bays. It, it can't possibly have all been considered at at day one no um, no and so inevitably there's going to be a little bit of of legacy and lag in terms of i'm not saying it's right but it is inevitable that where we are that, that we are where we are you know it's it's just no i don't mean we as in grid stuff i mean we as an industry um, and we just got to make sure that we that we fix it and we make provision for, for going forward and that's no. that's something. There's a uh, a comment from Ian Trot in the Q and A box, and I'm going to read it um, verbatim. It says, "I'm a wheelchair user, and I've been a regular EV user since 2015. My personal experience is that the charging network has become a lot less inclusive over the years. I've been campaigning for equal access to the network for all, but virtually no installation is fully accessible." And I've been rebuffed many times by infrastructure providers, which is disappointing. And he goes on to talk about will that legacy stuff catch up? I guess that this is about a huge investment to rip out what's already there and put in new accessible equipment. Yeah, and I think that my, my hope and my view is that it will improve because ultimately all the infrastructure generally needs to improve. You know, we've got to put in where we've got two chargers, we need to put in six. We've got to put in 12. They've got to be high powered. So there's all of those other bits and pieces that need to be what, what we have today is nowhere near good enough. We all know that. So it all has to be upgraded and built out anyway. So there, there is no reasoning why we can't add in provisions for this sort of accessibility topic whilst upgrading these networks. Um, although having said that, there are, you know, I, I've come from a point of view of, of GridServe that there's a lot of CPOs out there that have one charger in the back of a car park in a town hall somewhere that might be, you know, a different challenge. So, so it's easy for me to sit here and do that, knowing the scale that we're we're adopting, but that's not necessarily going to cover all the charge point operators' challenges going forward. No, no, I think our role here is very much to bring this to the fore and to have the conversation to learn. I mean, as you said, when we when we started this, you know, your limited experience isn't sufficient to be able to move this agenda forward. And what we're doing is we're reaching out to our base of people to say, look, we recognize there's a problem here. What do we need and how are we going to get there? And that's very much what we do. Um, uh, part of part of what we're we're also looking at is how we bring new entrants into the EV market. So fleets, big organisations that have a very diverse range of needs and drivers, uh, and it's easy to to run away with the idea that you know those in uh, who have disabilities and mobility restrictions don't work. Of course they do, and drive vehicles for fleets so paul we've been working because we're not just a talking shop we've been working on an initiative with one of our sponsors geotab to help bring a fleet into the world of ev tell us about it if you would i will definitely try my internet connection is unstable so please bear with me if it breaks up but yeah we've we've been working with geotab because geotab as i think i mentioned mentioned earlier, are able to bring data to the fore, which will give us insight to uh, help people make good decisions about moving to the right electric vehicle for them, be it van or car or whatever. And um, so we, we've worked closely with Geotab to come up with a, a strategy to give a, a fleet a chance to get some free consultancy from us at the EV Cafe um, and also some free devices from uh, Geotab. So Geotab will provide up to 100 devices to go into your vehicles to surface all the data that is needed to make good decisions about the journeys that you're making, whether electric will be suitable, and so on like that. And then our other partners are also going to help us over the course of that project of maybe around six months. So for the first three months, we'll take data, then we'll understand and analyze that data, bring the insight to the surface, and then help deploy electric vehicles 
to replace some of the diesel vehicles that you've got. So we're going to put it out there as a competition. You will um, be able to kind of submit your nomination for a company with little or no electric vehicles today, no real plan to do it. And then we will help you create the plan and then execute that plan as well with the help of Geotab in particular, but also our sponsors, My Energy and AA will also be helping. So everybody will be gathering together and will be making a real and tangible difference to that journey to go uh, electric, which is fantastic or zero emission. You know, if there is alternatives, we, we have talked a little bit about, you know, it's all about getting to zero emission. So our mission to accelerate the transition to zero emission or electric vehicles and this plays completely. So watch out for it. It will be coming out. You can put your nomination in and probably in, in, in May we'll be announcing who has won the free six months um, of consultancy in the sense of a, a six month project of consultancy to help you transition. So you'll need to spread the message far and wide because this is the idea of getting beyond the church of electric vehicles. We wanna go beyond the walls of what we're doing today and help people that haven't yet considered electric as an option. That chimes really well, Paul. Thank you for that. It chimes really well with, with inclusivity in that one of the biggest barriers to doing this and moving to EV is about fear. It's fear of the unknown. It's fear of, of making that leap from where you are to where you need to be. And one of the things we constantly discover is that we are an inclusive community of EV drivers. We all want you to succeed. Nobody's looking for you to fail and have a difficult time. It doesn't matter whether you're able-bodied, you have limitations, you have special sparkle, as I call it, uh, a different way of doing something. We're all in this together and we all want to make that contribution. So um, join with us as we start to really move forward and make things happen. JB had his finger in the air. <laughs> no, it's, uh, I just want to say it was really great to hear uh, Sam and Sarah's thoughts on this topic. It certainly makes for a change. Um, and, uh, <laughs> I look forward to seeing the submissions over the in due course. But uh, it's, it's now time to, to really move on to the next part of the show and uh, welcome our first special guest for today, uh, which I believe is going to be Dan Turner from Plymouth City Council. So, mm. yeah, Very I'd uh, like to welcome you onto the EV Cafe. Hope you've enjoyed it so far. And uh, just quickly, before you make a start, Dan, I can see the chat box is alive and kicking and some questions are already coming in. Um, just, just keep them coming, and we'll go to the mail boy, otherwise known as JC, very shortly. So over to you, Dan. Thank you very much. Yeah, I've, uh, I feel about as prepared as you guys seemed when I logged on at the start. So, uh, <laughs> really good place. Rude. Really good place. That's very Too bad. Rude. And that's yeah. enough of Dan. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great. I love it. It's great. It's great. Brilliant madness. Um, so I guess I'm from Plymouth City Council, and. Um, you know, as, as a council in the work that I'm doing, I've been doing renewable energy projects historically, and now come on to doing EV projects. And always <laughs> wanted to use, you know, there's a lot of money out there for infrastructure. And we, you know, fortunately as a council, have been quite successful in getting that. But you always want to make the most of that funding and that opportunity. Um, and I think, you know, so how can you take these infrastructure projects um, in terms of delivering EV infrastructure, and use that to tackle some of these larger societal issues. Um, inclusivity is obviously a massive issue. And I think, you know, some of the criticism of the EV sector, while is completely valid, it's also, you know, they've adopted that. It, it's been a societal issue. It's something that we've, you know, maybe haven't changed it and transitioned as well as perhaps we could have done as a sector, but it is, you know, there is a responsibility to do that, but it's a making, us aware of those societal issues first so i think we, we've tried to do that um through through some of our projects and inclusivity obviously covers a, a broad range of things um, we've sort of mentioned a lot about accessibility uh, particularly physical accessibility of charge point infrastructure but also looked a bit at um, things such as affordability as well gender equality and i think there's there's a number of pillars of inclusivity that we probably need to 
need to cover and we, we can address. And in fact, it's a huge opportunity for the sector to uh, be much better than, than any other rival sector, anything before, um, and preempt some of these issues and yeah, use our position to uh, transition uh, to EVs, tackle climate emergency in a sort of fair and just manner. And I think you know there's a lot of talk around climate justice in particular, and that is that is you know at the heart of this issue. Um, so I think in terms of you know, I'll give an overview of what we've done in Plymouth. Um, I know Claire's going to talk from Urban Foresight in a minute. And through an Innovate UK project, we were lucky enough to, to team up with them um, to do some work on accessibility guidance of charging infrastructure. So we, we have published that. And if anyone hasn't seen it, uh, very happy to share it, of course. Um, and that really came about through, you know, we're doing an on street charge point project and we're talking, yeah. We spend far too much time together over the last two or three years and then um, things such as accessibility come up quite a lot and it's like well how can we tackle this issue it doesn't feel like we've we've mastered this yet um, particularly as a, a planning authority we've got a responsibility to our residents um, and you know what we don't want to do is design people out of, of this transition to EVs in Plymouth 10% of the population um, has issues with uh, sort of day-to-day -day activities because of a disability or physical impairment um, in terms of long-term health issues that's about 28 percent it's a huge percentage of the population so to design them out would be insane on, on any level um, so we've produced this guidance and the guidance covers a range of things and i know there's been a lot of talk about the, the infrastructure side and how the infrastructure is designed but it's also things such as the, the location of the charge points so I'm not putting them, as you mentioned earlier, Sam, I believe, sort of far away in a dark corner of the car park, which is you know, really hard to get to for anybody. There might, there might be steps in the way or something like that as well. Um, so what we're, we've committed to doing now is taking that guidance, which Claire will talk a bit more about, and we're going to do impact assessments on every site in future, uh, looking at inclusivity in particular. Um, we're going to be very careful with our site selection. And we've also got some information to put into our, our procurement. I think that's quite important for the sector as well, because if you're a charge point operator and you're looking to work with local authorities, then procurement is going to be required. And if authorities are starting to ask for certain things around inclusivity and accessibility, then the market will have to adjust. So, and and I guess you know the key the key thing I don't, don't want to run over time, but is you know, around collaboration and how we identify these issues. And then um, through the work with Urban Foresight, we've worked with all local organisations such as PADAM, Access Plymouth, uh, Motability on a national level. Um, but then also things such as our parking team, our highways team, talking to infrastructure providers. And I think the key is that the supply chain works together on this. It's not, a, you know, it's not like this is an issue for councils or an issue for EV infrastructure um, operators. Um, it's, it's all together. So... There is a need to do that. And I think, you know, Sarah and I have spoken quite a bit around the everyone group and um, trying to, to tackle those issues and bring people together. And indeed looking to do some events in the future where we can have workshops with the whole supply chain. And perhaps as was mentioned, um, get people down to Plymouth to walk around some sites and see, you know, where things are accessible, where they're not and experience it from, you know, another person's standpoint. And I think it's only with that sort of collaboration and raising of awareness that we can really tackle this issue. And hopefully then through things such as that policy change, procurement, et cetera, on a local level, we can, um, yeah, we can actually get to where we need to be. I feel like I've, I've had my five minutes, so I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> you will. You have, I'm loving it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So can you tell us a bit more about the group that we were saying, the, um, Everyone, it's a play on words, easy everyone. Sure. everyone. <laughs> so, uh, so the everyone group, I think um, that was just, it came off the back of the work we were doing with Urban Foresight. We were talking a lot about accessibility and just, there is, there's a bigger problem here. This is not a Plymouth problem. This is, this is not even an issue we can solve through one little bit of guidance, one guidance document. So got in touch with a few people I know in the sector, yourself included, Sarah, um, to say, Am, am I crazy? Uh, is this something we, you know, or is this an issue? Um, and now we've got a nice, you know, we've had some very productive conversations. 
um, start to share some information between us. And, you know, I guess it, it's very clear, uh, you know, where the gaps are now and what we need to do to, to you know, bring more people into the conversation and having things such as EV Cafe promoting this issue is, is really important in that. So, so as a group, it's very much about promotion and awareness of the issues and trying to share information. Um, so I think, yeah, I think we've got a LinkedIn page, haven't we, that people can follow? Um, shameless plug. And, uh, <laughs> thank you very much on it. Um, so, um, yeah, I think it's a place where, you know, such as that guidance, we'll, we'll share that. But we really, really want to hear from everybody across the supply chain and, and users as well um, on their experience, things we can look at. And we will do our best to pull together information that already exists or if information doesn't exist. You know how how can we attain that or put in trials, etc. Over to Paul, and then we'll open that mail room. Just just a quick question for you, Dan, and and it's interesting to me. There's a number of people on the on the call that have a particular interest uh, in vans, and I wonder, does I mean, it's not quite the same, but it, it's inclusive. And and what I've noticed from my interactions with vans trying to charge is that they can be a problem if, if it's not easy for people so that they can impact others uh, as much as anything. How do vans feature in the research? So primarily we folk, I mean, originally it was on what we have in Plymouth existing. So we had a baseline and then we've looked at what we can do in the future. So things such as in, uh, increasing the size of parking bays helps significantly. I mean, for small vans in particular. Our research hasn't focused, for example, on fleets. This has been much more public infrastructure at this point. Um, and our research hasn't also focused on the vehicles themselves. Um, so that's, you know, that is something where we can, can develop further. What we have done, some of it is very generic to any user though. Um, things such as signage, bay markings, the colors used, et cetera. You know, this doesn't change whoever's used, operating the vehicle. So I think, We've focused on what applies to pretty much everyone at the moment. A person-centric approach rather than a vehicle-centric approach. Yeah. Yes, yeah, correct. But there's definitely a need. That's where the collaboration across the whole supply chain is required. Mm -hmm. um, and more conversations in that area would be helpful. Good, thank you. Over to the mailboy. Do you know what? There's a lot of love for vans. Can I just say, a lot of love in the, in the chat. For, for vans what's wrong with you people <laughs> <laughs> dan right with them dan got a question for them? you D just wish wished it's about our guests yeah. and me <laughs> um <laughs> i've got a question from john hill John Hill's a Plymouth Council candidate in this year's elections and also a trustee of the Plymouth Disability Area Action Network. He's also a wheelchair user. Please, can you tell me more about the EV grants for mobility vehicles and what helps being offered by Plymouth City Council? You've kind of started on that, but could you develop that somewhat? I think in terms of Plymouth City Council's role for infrastructure, um, it's really about we've now we are now hoping to take an approach where it goes into policy that any charge point infrastructure put in is inclusive for everyone it's, mm. it's not about having one or two bays for example where it's suitable for wheelchairs users it's about inclusivity for all for example if you're a wheelchair user well actually lots of the problems you'll encounter will be the same as those encountered by uh, somebody pushing a pushchair with yep. three kids in the back of their car so we we've i think if we start to section off portions of the, uh, the public, that becomes a very difficult problem. In yeah. You know, we're gonna have so much variety, it's gonna be impossible. So I think we, we really do need to include everyone in the consideration for design and make the design, um, yeah, yeah, suitable for all. Uh, how, do should, avoid, should how do you avoid that committee to design a horse thing though? Because trying to include everyone is hugely challenging. When I'm six foot four and have full mobility, fully understand that somebody who's in a wheelchair has different needs, but the physical kit that you use is fixed. How do you do that? I, th I think 
th there will always be a need for some customization. And it may be that, you know, for example, charge point infrastructure changes so you can tilt, change the tilt on the screen. You know, yeah. things like that are possible within um, within the manufacturing. Also, things such as ATMs are a good example. If you go to a bank, actually on the wall, some ATMs are quite high, some are quite low. Yeah. That's there for an accessibility reason. So I think we can certainly create a baseline where it's there for everyone, such as the bay marking and the signage and everything. And then there'll be elements of customization on the side of that, um, which will hopefully allow everyone to, to access. Oh, Dan, you're brilliant, because that leads br so nicely, so smoothly into another question from Gideon Richards, who says, do we need formal standards for this discussion so that everyone's needs are taken into account and available at all sites? So almost pulling together a knowledge base of what we know, the sort of things that we've seen from both Sarah and Sam, the things you're doing in Plymouth. Is there a way that we can pull this together, maybe through Motability, to start to set some standards that we can all refer to? I think, yeah, there's certainly aspects where we can set standards without question today. There's enough information. And of course, other sectors have done lots of work on accessibility mm. and we can draw upon what they have done. Mm. And that has been in policy for a long time. So we don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel. Um, there will be bits, I, I think we, what we've got to build in and what we've tried to build in into the policy in Plymouth is we will review it every single year because this technology is changing very quickly. The sector is changing very quickly. For us to predict what's coming 10 years down the line mm. is, is tricky. So I think, yes, we can do something, but we need to build in a review process on, on almost an annual basis. Love it, brilliant. Sarah, hand in the air, like you just don't care. Being so polite. Um, it's because Catherine actually sent, Catherine Maris, sorry, from Motability, sent through something earlier. She said it's good to highlight there's a national standard for accessible EV charging under development by the British Standards Institution, OZEV, and Motability, with input from across industry and disability sectors. The draft will go out for public consultation at the end of this month. So if people could please keep their eyes peeled for that announcement and engage during the one month long public consultation, that would be fantastic. Thank you so much, Catherine. Superb. And uh, a final question before we go back to uh, our next guest is from Michael Barton. Johnny, you need to hear this one, my friend. Michael Barton, it's my birthday coming up soon. How can I get an EV Cafe mug as a present to myself? Seriously, man? <laughs> Ask the best question. Ask a good or question for a start. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or visit our merchandise shop. <laughs> So we haven't opened yet. Yes. Dear lordy, self-promotion. Now, you've got to ask a good question, my friend. Uh, Dan, superb. Thank you ever so much. Uh, Johnny, over to you. Well, actually, not over to me. Over to Sam. To Sam, um, we're going to introduce the next special guest, please. Um, you were supposed to do Dan's, but we just fell short on time. And I just want to say uh, thanks, Dan. Thanks for that. And uh, do come back on it shortly, the last round of Q&A. So over to you, Sam. Yeah, thank you, Johnny. Okay, next next up is Claire, um, who's already on borrow time because her battery's about to run out, she told us earlier. Uh, but hopefully there's enough to, there's enough left for uh, for this. But uh, yeah, so Claire's the principal consultant at Urban Foresight. Uh, Claire is responsible for managing complex multi-partner, multi-million pound projects with a focus on renewables, the environment, equity, and innovation. So that's basically everything that we're discussing today. Um, and I noticed, Claire, on the uh, on your recent posts on LinkedIn, um, mm -hmm. you were referencing the uh, the trial of a prototype accessible EV charge point at Dundee City Council, which I have no doubt you're about to tell us about. Um, but, um, but yeah, thank Walker. you very much. <laughs> but, well, thank you very I'd, much. I'd bit... Not if I didn't do a shameless plug. So yeah, yeah, shameless <laughs> plug. Nice pun. Well done. Um, anyway, uh, yeah. In that, on that note, over to you, and uh, look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Oh, brilliant. Thanks, Sam. Thanks for the introduction. Um, and thank you, everyone, for inviting me on the podcast um, to talk about something that I'm really passionate about and that Urban Foresight are also really passionate about as well. I'm probably going to talk quite quickly because I'm aware my battery is going to die and I might have to swap to my mobile. <laughs> so apologies if I am talking quite quick. Um, as Sam just said, uh, my name is Claire Pennington. I'm Principal Consultant at Urban Foresight. I'm based out of our Dundee office. Um, I work in the electric mobility group and our projects range from supporting a bike charity in Dundee to get recycled bikes out to families from deprived backgrounds, 
um, to leading on the multi-million pounds Clean Streets project for Innovate UK. Um, I'm sure quite a lot of you will have already seen the brilliant UE1 pop-up charges um, that that project's trialling. A couple of years ago, um, Transport Scotland and Scottish Enterprise launched a fund um, that was aimed at developing tools to help charging easier for people. Um, and it was at this point that we really became aware of, of sort of the lack of accessibility around EV charging infrastructure. I'll admit now I've got a vested interest. Um, I suffered a traumatic brain injury about, gosh, it must have been about nine years ago um, as a result of an accident. So I understand that people have very, very different experiences of things that other people may take for granted. Um, you know, a good example of that is fueling a car. Our research um, that, we, that we've sort of been doing for the last couple of years, it led us to work with charities, with sector experts, with motor manufacturers such as General Motors, organisations like Motability, who I know are on the call today, um, and the Research Institute for Disabled Consumers. And I think what we found actually really, really shocked us. Um, so I know everyone likes a statistic. Um, so I just pulled a, a couple out from our own research here, just to kind of paint the picture for people who might not be so aware. In 2021, research that we did with the Research Institute for Disabled Consumers, only 25% of people with disabilities would consider buying an EV. And that was basically down to the inability to be able to charge or a lack of confidence in being able to charge. Now, there are 14.1 million people in the UK with a disability and 40% of the over 60s are considered to have a disability. So if you do the maths, those are potentially huge numbers of people who either can't charge or find it really difficult to. If charging was made more accessible, that number rises to 61%. <coughs> Compound that with when we when we did sort of a, a, a survey of charge points in Scotland and South West England, we found that as few as 2.6% of um, EV charge points met even sort of basic accessibility criteria. The impact of this on the government's ability to meet its rate to zero is clear, um, but I think less obvious is the impact that this will have on people's lives. So being able to travel freely and, and flexibly means people can go to work. They can visit friends and family, then go shopping, all the things that many other people take for granted. So the potential that the move to, you know, a fairer, greener transport system could actually be more unfair for sort of parts of our community and prevent people from doing things that other people take for granted is really unthinkable. Um, and this just seems so unbelievable to us and really kind of spurred us on to go beyond the research that we'd be doing um, beyond the report writing and talking about the challenges to really genuinely collaborating with people, um, partners and users to kind of start to think about what the solutions might be um, and how we can make sort of those genuine tangible improvements for people. So we started off with the funding from Transport, for Scot Transport Scotland and we worked with partners to successfully develop a, a kind of, it started off low tech, it ended up being a bit more high tech. Um, tool that it's affordable and makes it easier and quicker for people to charge at existing charge points because we know retrofitting is going to be prohibitively expensive so it'll help people charge at those thousands of charge points that are already in the ground um, it removes the need to carry heavy cables um, or to have to pick them up from the ground then with funding from innovate uk um, our consortium we've been sort of working over the sort of last eight nine months developing an accessible charge point um, that delivers solutions to kind of the main barriers that I know people have already touched on on, on this call today. So I won't, I won't sort of go into those and re repeat them again. Um, but many people have seen sort of the images of our first public trials of this charge point across social media this week. We also started working with local authorities um, who really wanted their infrastructure to be as accessible as possible for all communities. And Dan, who we've just heard from, and who I, I will remember, Dan, you made a, a, a slight rude remark about me. Um, I'll pick that up later with you. <laughs> um, Dan basically came to us and said, you know, how do we make sure that we roll out EV infrastructure that's fair for everyone? And what we delivered to Plymouth was what we think is the first guidance in the UK for the rollout of accessible infrastructure. It wasn't just outlining the challenges, but it gave really practical solutions as well. 
We're currently working with Dundee City Council on their fourth charging hub, um, helping them put in place measures that will make the hub as accessible as possible. And for us, this is really kind of a, a first step and it will be a huge learning curve for everyone, not just us, but the teams within Dundee City Council as well and the CPO. And we really hope that, that this kind of stands as evidence that it can be done. It's not gonna be perfect, but given budget, given the location, given everything else, it will be as good as we can make it. Um, and I think probably the thing that I'm most proud about of what we've done over the sort of the past two years is that everything we've done and please excuse this really cheesy pun is entirely user driven um we've kept people right at the heart of everything and rather than it being dr driven by the technology we've been driven by people's needs and use the technology to come up with the solutions and i think this approach of, of considering accessibility right from the start rather than as an afterthought means that everybody gets an improved experience. I mean, Dan touched on, on the idea of sort of, it's, it's not just people who use wheelchairs that struggle to get between parked cars and struggle to get to charge points. It's people who've got baby buggies. It's people who um, have, you know, a, have to use a walking stick. It's people who are using walking frames. It's, it's, it's so many people um, and everybody gets an, an improved experience if we, if we improve the accessibility. So I think we're really passionate that the transition to EVs is an opportunity really to do things better. Um, and that's why it's so important that the accessibility and the equity are really embedded at every stage of design from the hardware development through the design of the space to the location that's chosen um, and equally the user journey as well. And I think the best way to do this um, is to collaborate with people who have those different lived experiences. Sorry, that was an absolute brain dump sorry i'll stop talking now <laughs> thank you very much claire thank you um so i think actually it's time to uh go into the studio to see sarah live from news round and then following that we will uh, go to the mail room so i can see that uh disappeared off the screen to yeah. go get ready <laughs> you've, you've so we'll totally Totally stitched her up. She wasn't expecting that. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. nice. There we go. <laughs> oh dear. Hi, I'm Sarah Sloman, Snowman, Slocum, Solomon, and this is the 90 Second News. Friend of the EV Cafe, Anthony Carhill of Pramac and Off Grid Energy fame, brought some exciting news this week about the circular economy. Jaguar Land Rover have announced that they have partnered to create a zero emissions charging unit using Second Life iPace batteries. The mobile off-grid battery energy storage system is charged using solar panels and supplies zero emission power where access to the main supply is limited or unavailable. This is vital as JLR aims to reach net zero status by 2039 and is frankly super cool. So well done off-grid energy and JLR together. Meanwhile, topical for today's session, the brilliant Jonathan Jenkins, Head of Innovation at Motability Operations, has contacted the show, which is an absolute lie because I tapped him up for a quote. But anyway, he said, the transition to electric vehicles is bringing with it a diverse set of challenges, particularly for those with a disability. Research has found that up to 50% of disabled drivers and passengers will be very reliant on the public charging network by 2035, as they are unlikely to be able to charge their vehicle off street at home. That's not to be ignored. And thank you, Jonathan. Accessibility needs to be at the forefront of the EV transition to make the move to EVs as smooth as possible for everyone. See what they did there. And they recently announced pilots with Charge Ferry and Co Charger. So watch this space. And finally, we would like to congratulate all of those present at the Fleet News Awards. Special recognition to the National Grid, who won the Wellbeing, Diversity and Inclusion in Fleet. Lorna, you are simply wonderful. And Fleet of the Year, sponsored by the mighty AFP, the Association of Fleet Professionals, went to Brecon Beacons National Park Authority. Well done, Kevin. And of course, Jamie Fretwell, Mercedes-Benz Trucks. What a wonderful community we are in. And well done to all. Speaking of which, guess what? What else has happened? We have the wonderful Generate Media and That Ticket, who are now handling our socials. None of this riffraff, disorganized stuff that you've seen from us. It's going to be really fun. Please get involved, share, and help us to grow your community, help everyone accelerate the transition to electric vehicles. And that's probably about 90 seconds. And that's it for the EV Cafe News. 
get your stories over to me for April. But wait, there's more, more news just in Auto Trader by Vanarama. So if only we knew someone who used to know that world very well indeed and who loves a good van. Paul, what do you make of this exciting partnership? Well, I'm really glad you raised that because, I mean, clearly two years ago, I went there to help them with their electric vehicle strategy. And then shortly after they get bought for 200 million pounds. Well, you know, I, I can't help but uh, exaggerate unfairly my influence on that deal. But it is really interesting and it shows the consolidation um, approach, both in the leasing market and also, um, you know, we're seeing consolidation all over the place, aren't we? So it is exciting news and I'm very interested to see how that changes that area of the market. Dude, Panorama got bought once you'd gone. <laughs> Shh, that, he was not supposed to make that link. Way, way after he went, actually. <laughs> never getting that check. That's not coming. I oh, know, I know. I didn't get yeah. any shares, just saying. Yeah, Andy, you got offered 10,000 when Paul worked for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so we've got eight minutes left of our official EV Cafe session until we go move over to the after hours session. Should we answer some more questions, John? Yeah, so the after hours session, let's just explain that before everybody goes. Paul, Paul's got a question before we go to the Q&A tab. John, who's got his hand go up? Go on then, 200 million boy. <laughs> well, uh, so it, it, I think it's topical because I was thinking, how can we help accelerate the transition for the community, particularly when you think motability operations have a fleet of 600,000 vehicles? Yeah. That's a big, big pool. Um, we were talking to Jonathan the other day. Apparently, another 1.4 million people are eligible to take advantage of this. And I'm thinking we're giving um, fleet users a very big incentive typically somewhere in the order of three or four thousand pounds every year in a tax break surely wouldn't we all be willing to redress that balance and put the money in a way that would help that tra transition for the whole community not just a small part of it what do we think I think Rishi Sunak is about to get on his feet if he's not already. Um, be interesting to see what's in the the uh, spring statement. But yes, absolutely. I think we've got to, we've got to use all all of the levers that we've got in government to make these things happen. We know from the engagement that we've seen in the chat box just how passionate people are about this area, and I think government needs to recognise that this matters. Breaking news. Mm. There you go. Did you read that? Jamie just put some up. Rishi yeah. Sunak has announced five pence per litre reduction in fuel duty. How does the EV car feel? That sounds like an after hours chat to me. Stay on from one. I'm yeah, Jamie, let's there. do that. So after hours, basically what happens is stay online if you're uh, if you're bored and got nothing else to do because you can come behind the scenes and that's when the wheels come off, literally. Uh, and we just What's chat that? nonsense for half an hour. So you can come on, you can talk to us, you can come live, camera, all that stuff. And we just talk nonsense. So uh, well, yeah, I've, now there's a poll. I've, been, I've apparently been talking nonsense even before. So it's 650 yeah. or 60,000 vehicles, not 600,000, as I incorrectly stated. So uh, Jonathan, no thank you for picking me up on that. And uh, there's a correction for you. We don't put it on the back page. We put it right up front when we get it wrong. Right. We've got five minutes. John, let's do some quick fire questions in the Q&A tab. And Dan and Claire, if I could ask you to come back on, that'd be fantastic. Help us oh, this is so fun. Questions. So we need to just answer really succinctly. <laughs> um, Get answering the poll. Lloyd Allen has asked the best question of the day. I don't care about anybody else. Lloyd, you are the best question of the day because there's five parts to it. Um, Bristol City Council designed their own charge points. Could anyone suggest some good example charge point site visits uh, that are outside of the southwest but not too far? Uh, number two. Thanks for the report that Dan Turner shared. Uh, might be nearby Plymouth for a couple of days mid-April. Any chance I could visit? It seems like we're getting people connected. Please could I access some of the diagrams and site examples shown earlier by Sam and Sarah? Yeah, absolutely, I'm sure you can. And where are we? Paul, 
Any guidelines on how wide or long or other considerations to allow for large vans? That would be helpful. What you got, mate? So um, you need at least 2.5 meters in width because the average van is 2.2 meters or thereabouts, but then you've got the wing mirrors, which are blooming huge. So, I mean, 2.5 is probably the minimum. Um, and then the typical large van is six meters plus long. So I get that there is a space problem, but we also need to think about how we get them in and out uh, because they need to be angled so that they can see as they're reversing if they have to go in nose front, but better still, put the charger at the back so that they can drive out and see uh, wherever they're going and reverse it much better. So there's a there's a balance here, Sam related to it earlier. Where does the charge point go? And also how big and angle and ways of access. It's 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 a big challenge. Can't be quick. Well, got to say, Lloyd Allen, for for the four part question, you get to win a mug. So thank you for that. Uh, drops your details. I'm sure Sarah has them, uh, and we will supply your mug. Sam, stand by. A couple of questions for you. Oh, he's got his hand in the air. I have a hand in the air. Yeah, I was, you want? I was going to answer point one of Lloyd's. Um, I just want to say Lloyd because of uh, Lego people don't understand that one. Yeah, um, go for it. Uh, so Lloyd. Uh, to answer your first point, a good example, uh, Swansea Hub in GridServe, which is behind me now, uh, is a good example of accessible, I'll get out of the way so you can see it, um, of proper accessibility with proper bays and no drop, no curbs to navigate. So if you want a good example, I suggest you go there. Very nice bump stops, if you don't mind me saying. Oh, okay. um, now, Sukhvinder Ubi asks, Sam, are you designing, considering inductive EV charging? And this could do away with the cable connection and surely be more accessible and inclusive. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, as a business, we're technology agnostic because things change all the time. Um, however, induction charging, in my humble opinion, is very useful in smartphones and toothbrushes, not particularly in cars. Um, I think there is definitely a need for it in niche environments and accessibility for um, for people with mobility issues that could potentially have an induction charging for solution. Certainly on a, on a home driveway, for example, could be a really, really good way of being able to achieve an easy charging session without needing to have the, uh, the challenges of plugging cables in. I think on a commercial wider blends, and this is my opinion, not that of my employer, um, but I think it's an awful lot of over-engineered technology for the time being where we need to get as many people into EVs as possible and a cable is doing a very good job um, without the additional um, costs attributed to it. And, and the, the infrastructure requirements for dynamic charging is off the charts. The um, uh, static charging is also incredibly expensive. And to get may all the OE OEMs to invest and commit to some sort of universal um, induction charging plate solution on the bottom of their cars without the need, therefore, to add an extra cost in retrofitting, I think is years away. As, Thank as you as for as that as very as short and succinct answer. Uh, I, Johnny, I think we're getting near the end, aren't we, mate? I've got questions, but I think we'll leave the questions until the after hours and just say goodbye to those that need to jump off at one o'clock. Um, and uh, yeah, and let's say a big thanks to Dan and Claire for their input this afternoon. Really valuable stuff. Um, really great to just sit in here in my little room in, in the Institute of Directors and listening in. So, oh, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> I had nowhere else to go. It's either that or Brett. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. And uh, I'm going to stop the recording now for the after hour. Oh, done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to away from that. So, so yeah, let's just continue the questions, John. First question comes from Mac Mool, and it was it was the first question that we got, but it wasn't appropriate for the live session. Mac Mool says, "How did you guys get together and come up with the idea for the EV Cafe?" Well, Mac, I can only assume you're new to this because uh, we've told the story a gazillion times. But Johnny Berry, who's now disappeared, sorry, but it's important to keep door. telling the story so that new people know about it. Precisely. JB, how did it start, Mel Fruit? Good Tell question. us, Johnny. So, yeah, yeah. So, um, when Boris locked us down for the first time, um, you know, it's coming up to nearly one two year years ago, ago today.
today, by the way. In two years ago today. Two sorry. years. Yeah, yeah. Two years ago. Flown we need, by, today. We need yeah, to get yeah. a stat police to sort Paul Kirby out. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, one, two, what difference it make? So, yeah, I understood the challenges of business space just in everyday operations. And, uh, but I, I, I saw that it was really important to keep the conversations going in terms of helping them support their decarbonisation journey. So um, the, the original I plan was just a kind of a drop-in surgery every week. Um, and then uh, I said, I rang up Paul and I said, Paul, I've got this great idea. Let's, uh, let's jump on a call on a Wednesday, every Wednesday at 12 o'clock to one. We started on Adobe. Um, and it's your first mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, so we, we, we were doing it every week, every week between 12 and two. So two hours every week. And to be honest, we, we started off the first few sessions. We had, you know, we were getting close to, uh, you know, 100 people on each session. So, and then I started to, well, Paul and I started to think about, how is this going to look in the future? And we brought on, of course, the rest of the team that make up now the Avengers. Um, and uh, we all come as uh, five of us as the EV Cafe. So yeah, and it's been, it's a wonderful two years. Loved every single second of it. Well, not every single second, yeah. but you know, most of <laughs> it. <laughs> um, not, not today though. I mean, I've just banged my head on the very low ceiling Aww. of this little Room, yeah, and this this table is very short. So I mean, is the Institute like, of Direct is not good enough for you, Johnny? Sorry, is the Institute of Direct is just not good enough for you, Johnny? It's not good enough for me. I'm going to write a complaint straight after it. It's <laughs> hearing us answer your question. Whoever answered asked it. Sorry, hearing, no, I didn't. Hearing yeah. you answer that question, Johnny, it's a little bit like listening to Tom Hardy read Jack and Ori. <laughs> really. <laughs> I'm oh yeah, that, so. I could listen to you at bedtime. Oh. <laughs> anyway, um, right. So, Paul, I think this is a question for you. Ewan from Merthyr Tidville Council has asked, what's the best platform or site to review or check reviews for companies that install EV chargers or management systems for fleets, including HGVs? Any ideas? Paul, Earth to Paul. Yeah, sorry, my internet dropped out for a second there. I'm just reading the question. Check reviews companies that install EV charge management system fleets. I don't think there is a no. platform site to review or check reviews. I it's a it's a really good point. Um well, sort of. I mean, which the independent accreditation body are starting to do independent reviews of installers and charge point management systems. Well, there you go. So it wasn't a question for me. It was a question for Sarah. There you Basically, go. If, if no one knows, I, I might know a bit, but not all of it. But I just know they are beginning to do it. But it's very expensive for us to do it. So if the CPO or installer wants to do it, it's, it's a fairly lengthy, costly process. So at the moment, you're right to ask because it is thin on the ground. Can I just say, I learned a fact about, um, it's not far from Merthyr Tidville, and I'm sure the gentleman will correct me very shortly, but um, Kefili. So did you know, this is oh, really God. interesting, Caerphilly oh, had the, uh, the most polluted road in the UK. So <laughs> polluted, so polluted was it, that the, the Welsh government bought 23 people out of their houses and moved them away because the road was so such a polluted stretch of travel. And I, I was incredible. It just talks about the, the importance of air quality. And that was in Carmarthen, in a place where you imagine there's going to be lots of air and it's it's more rolling countryside, but not so. It was yeah, uh, often the case. We had that in North Somerset where people are like, but it's so rural. How is this a problem for you? Why are you pushing green agenda? And I'm like, because everybody lives here, drives through it to get to Bristol, and, and also we've was, got the port and the airport and the M5. So it was a cut through. It was a cut through that lorries were using regularly, and it was at the bottom of a valley. And it just, all the air and the smog just sat there. Most polluted road in Britain. So, Caerphilly, uh, well done, Welsh Government, for sorting that out, recognising the problem and addressing it. Anyway, just thought I'd share. Well, you're quite right. Uh, according to Ewan, Yian, however you pronounce... I'd be Yian, wouldn't it? Yeah. I do apologise, uh, whichever way it is. He says, you're right. This never happens. Wow. Why, why, Look at that. I'm right. Why do you see? Really? Had to happen. Well, I've just come in, come back to, to everyone saying Paul Kirby's right. So I feel like 
<laughs> this might be the end of the Uni Cup. Yeah. Parallel universe. <laughs> So, other questions. Bill N. Now, we've heard from Bill N before. Bill N. Ben. Do you remember that? Bill and Ben? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was great. Flubber-dum, flubber-dum, flubber-dum. He's never going to put uh, anyway. his name in as Bill N again. Oh, wee, is, get, wee. <laughs> is that you? Are you wee? <laughs> I'm a wee. <laughs> anyway, move on. Uh, queue management. So, assuming queue management uh, does everything that we think it will do, um, is there scope to build in priority access for users with specific needs? Hmm. So the two parts to that question, I think. One is, do we need to be able to book a slot to charge? And secondly, is there a priority given in certain bays for certain types of users? Oh, ho, 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 bun fight. Let's go. Uh, I think Paul was first, then Sam. Really? Yes. His answer will be rubbish, though. Yeah, true. <laughs> it's not going to be rubbish because, again, of course, you know I'm going to focus on commercial vehicles. I think there should be some priority given to um, commercial transport uh, because they have to charge and get on about their day. They're delivering goods. It could be time orientated. Um, and there should be some way of creating a system, whether it be jumping a queue, particularly, or some other system, but uh, of giving the uh, vans trucks of the world to and coaches even um to include uh, jamie fretwell's world um it's uh it's very important that we keep business moving but surely that's got to be provided by the organization you can't just rock up to a publicly available charger that mere mortals need to use when you're running a commercial business charging money that but, can't but be how right? else would it take place but you yeah. pay for it if an organization, let's say a logistics company, wants to use electric vehicles, surely part of their business case has to be putting in appropriate charging infrastructure for that to operate. But you can't put charging infrastructure across the whole country. Yeah, you can't. Yourself. So if you're trunking goods, you need to be able to pull in and charge somewhere. Of course you do. But that's not to say that it should be the public network that does that. That's a specific need. But Just a viewpoint. So the public network already has areas for trucks to, to fuel. Yes, exactly. Separate areas for trucks to fuel. Sam. Yeah, you guys, interesting debate, but you're got, you're mixing too many components at the same time. So I, I can't. Oh, agree. we're very sorry, Sam. Sorry to not please your <laughs> style of debate. Well, that was just a nice way of saying you were wrong, to be honest. But no, um, it, we're not wrong. We're very right. Well, yeah, you're not you're not right because it's, or it's not feel a poll. It's not a... right. It's, we, we can't we can't start booking commercial traffic into the existing public infrastructure because it, it, it carnage it, for a kickoff so much of it is not accessible for for commercial aspects so but again like i've said to you before paul we need we need to have a, a better structured approach to, to put charging commercial infrastructure into places that facilitate the van and the truck and the bus not the existing infrastructure that's already there because the two the two two simply won't won't merge um effectively and as but far as this the, already as as far as the queuing aspect is concerned, I mean, um, that's another good question. I think in the fullness of time, as this, as this industry matures, we'll have different mechanisms by <laughs> different mechanisms by which to uh, to charge in terms of the rate that you pay at different times, I suspect. Um, uh, and also um, uh, bookability, I think, is going to be important, especially in commercial world, because one point that Paul did make, which was bizarrely actually correct, was was that um, the dependency on, on regular exactly. charging and the reliability of it is absolutely paramount for logistics operations. And the only way to do that is to find some mechanism by which to book. So the Braintree Electric Forport has a queuing lane on purpose and a commercial lane on purpose that is designed in order to facilitate both of these variables. We've only got one of those in the whole country right now. So so that doesn't, that doesn't yes, I win again. <gasps> um, that, that, so uh, so yeah, so we've got, we've got a hell of a lot of work to do to get all of this working but there's so many complexities to it so many variables that we've got to, we've got to look at more oh. fills me with such oh don't don't even give him the glory did you not see how many people said neither 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 <laughs> worst the worst so statistically inaccurate some people um, and so, yet argument <laughs> yeah you did get the <laughs> the fleet argument is really interesting because i think 
like everything we've ever said, it shouldn't be a one size fits all and also shouldn't exclude fleet drivers from accessing the public charging. Should they need to, should they have to, if it's an emergency situation, you're very welcome, please do. But they should have their own network, surely. And if they can't fund it, then there's plenty of private operators out there who would happily pay for even the grid connection and all the charges you need and the space and acquire the land and everything else in between and set up all the payment systems and make it super easy for you. And then once you're out and about and roaming, this is why we need open data sharing. Everything about it needs to be more collaborative and it shouldn't be like, oh, there's a queue, let's let the van driver in. That's like going to the supermarket and I'm clutching like nothing and someone says, do you want to go first? I still say no. I don't think it's right to push in just because I don't have the same needs as them. So yeah, I don't know. I'm not I'm not into it. I think they need their separate infrastructure and feel good about that rather than having to shoot one themselves into stuff that's already oversubscribed by standard people moving around. Yes, Sarah. So Good I, work, Sarah. I, I agree with the point, but the fact is there are vans on the road today. You can't now, just magically yeah. change everything. So we have to think about what, but for development for the future, yes, I agree. Develop with the ideal in mind, like we should have done from the beginning, but we didn't. But you cannot just go, oh, you can't use this because you're a van. That's we actually kind of did. The government did support vans before they supported individual people for making the switch you know with the grants and uh the grants for both chargers and the vehicles themselves so but at the same time there wasn't that many vehicles available for commercial fleets so it's, it's all just gone a little bit wrong actually i remember saying the oems and the vans need to have more choice and more vehicles out there and now we're like oh my god we've got to put more charging equipment in as quickly as we physically possibly can oh and by the way they need to be fully available to everyone at all times it's just a lot. There's a lot going on behind the scenes. And I do think private funding is, is a really important key to unlocking this. Even if it means as a landowner or a business owner, you're relinquishing that asset to someone else. At least it means you get, you don't go around putting petrol pumps in everywhere. You put them in specific places if you run a big logistics business. So, I mean, just let, let the big boys play. A poll is a question that you might actually know the answer to. <laughs> David. Oh, David. Really? <laughs> David Pets, he says, what does the panel think? But we're going to give you this chance, Paul, to redeem yourself. What does the panel think is the best industry platform to help a fleet decide if battery electric commercial vehicles are best for their business versus an internal combustion engine? Go for it, my friend. <laughs> what is the best platform? Well, there are, there are a lot of people out there looking to help. Um, and they're doing good analysis, small startup businesses. Uh, one that springs to mind is Diode. Um, they're doing some work. There is others like uh, GemServe, I think. There's another one out there. Um, but it, it's about kind of taking data and giving insight. So, of course, our own sponsor, Geotab, is able to take data from, um, from the system, from the vehicles, from your diesel vehicle, and overlay whether or not an electric vehicle will work for you. So of course, I'm gonna say that Geotab are definitely a really good option, but there are some that give a more consultative approach on every aspect of the electrification in terms of you know charging and power and all of those good things as well as. But from a vehicle perspective, from a commercial vehicle perspective specifically, I would say that Geotab are a very well placed to give you the insight that you need to make the transition. Because yeah, it's all about knowing what you know, isn't it? Yeah. Sorry, uh, all jokes aside, Paul's entirely correct on this one. Um, yeah, Geotab do a great job, and I use them many times in the past on my previous businesses. But um, one other company might be worth looking at to answer the question is the Algorithm People, who um, is a, a company set up a few years ago, uh, former owner Colin Ferguson, uh, owner of RootMonkey uh, of old. Um, they have an incredibly good TMS transport management system, which analyzes all vehicles in your fleet of all sizes, whether it be electric or diesel or petrol. Um, and can do all of that um, information capture for you and, and tell you what the best solution is. So um, uh, I would highly recommend having a look at them because they've got some really, really good user experience, intuitive um, platforms that are browser based that can, that can help facilitate a solution in that regard. Andrew Stead uh, says that uh, Field Dynamics is a good option. Yeah. Uh, Sebastian Fleischacker from Barcelona. Voila! JC. Um, Yes, Sorry, mate. I was just going to suggest that we um, invite anyone that would yes. like to, to come yeah, off mute come and talk to us and Bring ask them us on. questions. Um, please raise your virtual hand and uh, we'll pick you out and take you off mute. 
Can so, I ask? Can I answer a couple of the quick questions in the Q and A? Just go, yeah. go, go, go. So one's from Sebastian around the uh, CCS connectivity, physically pushing heavy cables in. Um, I think whether it, whether it be C Chadamo or CCS, it's that is a that's a really good question, and it's a real challenge on the grounds that mm. the connectors themselves is one thing, but what it goes into, the, the sockets going into in the car is quite another. And so, in so many cars, it's really tough to get it in. And you kind of have to have a, a shoulder movement in order to get the cable in, because it's heavy anyway, and the connector and the, you know, the socket are, are quite tough. So I think a consideration needs to be on the vehicle that you choose and the positioning of that connector on the vehicle itself, based on what height you're at in order to get that in. So I think there's definitely, it's, it's, a, it's a very high, <laughs> high voltage, high security, high safety related socket, and therefore it has to be incredibly tight. But so it's difficult to put the, 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 the connector in, but, but, but it will definitely is easier on certain vehicles than others based on its positioning on the, on the vehicle. Um, and very, one other quick one from David in regards to the space between the ground barrier and the charger in the picture um, is a good question. Actually, Paul asked me this just the other day offline um, or online, but not on the EV Cafe. Uh, yes, there is, there's over a, a meter distance between um, at the back there in order to, to allow accessibility to this space, which isn't particularly well shown on the on the diagram, but also the, the bump stops and the bollards are in certain positions so that um, directly in front, you're able to get access to the to the charger without those things being in the way. <clears throat> Cheers, Sam. Right, so the first hand up is, uh, let's have a look. So we've got uh, Ian Trott. So I'd like to welcome Ian onto the EV Cafe and we'll allow you to talk now. So hello, Ian, you have a question hello. for us? Hello, how are you doing? Thank you for inviting me. That's good. Um, yes, uh, just a quick sort of point out the whole basic premise of um, bays with having the charge point at 90 degrees at the end of the bay is flawed in my my belief because basically I carry my wheelchair in the boot. My car charges at the rear like most cars do. As soon as I charge, I'm stuck in the vehicle. I can't get out. So basically, my idea is that all charge points bays are at 30 degrees you then have a void triangle which is created the charge unit sits in that void triangle with space in between you therefore don't need the bump stops because you're not going to hit them you can then get down the sides and then that also suits vehicles which and vans which charge at the side so to me that's a far better way and then your boot isn't obstructed to be able to get your wheelchair out so that most wheelchair users I know do have to carry their wheelchairs in the boot when they've got their family in the car. So by putting the charge unit at the end, mm -hmm. you're obstructing the boot unless you've got a front charging vehicle. So that's my sort of point. It's not just about extra space, it's about the, the whole layout. Mm -hmm. So if yeah. by putting them at 30 degrees, around 30 degrees, you create um, a triangle automatically space yeah. which is where you can sit the charger I think what, do, really, what do you think i think that's really interesting and um, ian <laughs> mm. I'll, I'll certainly take that one away and ask the planning guys in terms of what they think about that and, and, and why and whether or not there's any reasoning as to why that isn't plausible the question, yeah, quick question i've got yeah. for you back again actually yeah. is, is I mean, I'm, I'm intrigued that you have a vehicle with a charging flap on the back rather than yes. what, a vehicle that was on the front which probably would have been more accessible for you would it it and is what, it's all down decision to making process there yeah, I had a Nissan Leaf for four years, and I was very happy to continue which with is, that. Which is front middle. Yeah, but motability no longer offered at the time, though, that choice. So I had to go for um, an Outlander, reason being it rapid charge, and a bigger boot, I need the big boot. I use it as a pure EV. Um, so ideally for me, I'd be getting vehicles that charge at the front, but there's less and less and less of those available now. And more vehicles are, are going for what was traditionally, or we'll put the fill in point at the back because that's where you put petrol in. Um, vans in particular, they tend to charge around the front three quarters, which again is difficult because you won't get those on uh, to charge on a lot of the charging infrastructure is, is at the moment, um, you know, on the B pillar, for example, and a lot of WAVs, you know, drive from wheelchair vehicles will be vans when they sort out battery location with ramps and stuff. So yeah, that's that was my thinking. Are you always limited to what you can get on motability? It's a compromise between boot space, fitting your family in and where you're charging. <laughs> yeah. in, in, yeah. That's really helpful. And I, I love the way mm. that you're thinking about kind of the, the whole um, driver community. It's, it's excellent. Yes. Um, I think to answer some of, of your point, I think it, it's almost 
on the manufacturers themselves to kind of really think this through in terms of we, we've got to a fairly common place for cars where petrol will go in it's just a question of right or left hand side uh, yeah. and the rear three quarters um fuel tends to be right or left hand side just beside the uh the yeah. door panel um for, for for vans in terms of fuel but now we've just gone to a myriad of of different places both in cars and on vans and i do think it does require somebody to grab them firmly by the yeah. throat and i mean there's, um, there's a golden opportunity with a move. sort of common sense and a common approach yeah a golden opportunity with a move to evs you've got a clean sheet and you can do anything with vehicle design but most manufacturers are being very scared and they're doing traditional uh which is mm. yeah it's wrong uh, and also that the point is about you know Petrol filling stations, for example, has often said to me, yes, but how did say people manage to charge at petrol filling stations? And the answer is they don't. Um, <laughs> you've got lots of schemes in place where you've got uh, call assist and things like that, which work where obviously the place is staffed. Um, but this is becoming more of an issue where you've got pay at pump and it's becoming more and more difficult for disabled people to actually fill up because it's becoming less and less staffed um, filling stations or the your times that you can fill up is re drastically reduced um yeah to the there's some really stupid things Ian. thank you so thank much. you yeah. so much Ian. and um, that's okay. I'm sure it's really really helpful EV thank cafe you. crew and i we will certainly raise that in our yeah. campaign i guess so i'm willing uh, to help in any way i can because i'd love to uh, help more oh, yeah I'm thank you Ian. Yeah. There's Ian getting that's great on. thank you thank you sarah you were itching to speak only because I was totally in agreement and also Jonathan had just said that there was 36,000 vans in that motor mobility um, operations fleet that need support. And the other thing was about the length and uh, the length of the charging bay. I've got a standard car and I'm fortunate enough to not have any issues with charging. However, I constantly moan at Lloyd Allen, who I used to work with, because they've put tethered cables on their 50 kilowatt chargers, which actually don't even reach the front of my flipping Kia e-Nero. So I have to park at a jaunty angle just to get my e-Nero <laughs> charged. So it's, it's, it's yeah. stupid, a jaunty, jaunty. And so um, and one of that, there was an element of that study that I described that Mer did, which actually encouraged drivers to park, have a space so large that they could park on angles should they need to for accessibility in and out of the door, but also into the boot as well. So I think longer spaces could be a really good way of helping think back to that situation. You reverse in, but you don't have to worry because you've got a long cable and you've got space to open your boot and to get your wheelchair out. It doesn't seem unreasonable to me to, to enforce in the future the OEMs to have a directive in terms of where charging yeah. connectors go on vehicles. You know, yeah. it's and, um, and perhaps in the van world, you know, it's something like fronts only would or rear only, perhaps you know, one or the other would be would be the logical thing to do rather than this side by the B pillar thing, which is so legacy mm. of diesel, mm. diesel where the fuel mm. tank is, is yeah. nonsense. Yeah. It's, it's well, in even a totally on, wrong place. And on the front, Sam, um, with most common, the common act, most common accident, of course, is for vans to run into the back of something or to, to have that front end damaged. And it, it makes no sense, you know, to have a very expensive uh, mm. piece of equipment as your as your front nose. VWID Buzz has now moved it to the rear quarter, uh, quite low down, and it does actually make quite a lot of sense from a practical point of view. But yeah, you're right. I agree with you. Unless, unless of course, OEMs are building John. big fronts or fronks, <laughs> um, which we'll see many of them. John. I was just going to say, can we get Jamie Fretwell in the house? <laughs> yeah, so Maybe what I'm going house. to do... Is I'm going to allow Jamie, morning, to talk. Jamie. <laughs> and then we've got Andrew Stead shortly afterwards. So, Woo Jamie, welcome. Well, well, welcome back to <laughs> the EV Cafe. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Good to see How you, doing, bud? Yeah, not bad. Just wanted to say again, thank you very much for um, bringing everyone under the banner of inclusive mobility as well. I think all too often we can either come at it from a people centric approach or rather a vehicle centric approach. And it's really important to think, as a lot of the speakers have said today, it's not just about one particular type of disability. I know mobility, uh, wheelchair bound people, but as you mentioned about the information that's on the displays and what we're providing them with, or as Paul and I bang the drum about commercial vehicles and not just having cars uh, as a mindset. So just wanted to first of all say thank you very much to that, uh, to that end for, for you guys sharing that story. Um, and the second one, I think, is to really ask you guys the question, what more do you think we can do um, from a perspective of, of in our own sphere or as EV advocates 
to really promote it. I'm very fortunate. I'm not disabled, as despite what some of my colleagues were telling. Uh, I don't have any uh, challenges in getting around or, or using a vehicle, but that doesn't make me any less interested in uh, raising awareness and, and promoting the cause. So my question to the whole EV cafe really, I suppose, is what would you like to see or how do you think we can all promote it? I'd argue, Jamie, you're vertically challenged because you're really tall. <laughs> <laughs> very true, very true, sir. Oh, John and Paul have got their hands up. I think, John, you might- John, you go first, first John. All I was going to say was, I, th I think this goes back to the point that we were talking about earlier about standards. <clears throat> and I'd like to see national standards, which are brought in for uh, inclusive mobility. My grandson is uh, neurodivergent, so he's, he's nonverbal uh, and he has some serious challenges with experiences. So things like touch, uh, certain surfaces really freak him out. Uh, and it's something which I had no experience of until he was born three years ago. And as he's developed, we've learned so much. And I think it is about taking the advice that we are getting from all of these wonderful uh, people that we've had on the call today and in Motability and much wider, and pulling that all together in a set of standards which says this is best practice for now. And this is what we need to work towards, except that we've we've gone on a journey. We've put charging infrastructure in that was fit for purpose. It did its job. But as we develop and grow, we need to adhere to new standards, which will bring better and more easily accessible charging to all. Thank you. Paul? I, I was going to comment on um, my earlier uh, sort of comment really to say what can we do more I think government have have accelerated the transition by incentivizing um, company vehicles basically that, that's really what has driven the market forward at the pace that it's gone forward because people are getting significant um, pay rises really for running an electric vehicle because they don't have the same benefit in kind that they do on an ice vehicle or an internal combustion engine so I think there's definitely some there's a, there's a point in time which government needs to stop doing that and take that money that they will then recover over time, which is the right thing to do and invest that money somewhere else. And that could well be something like the Motability Operations Fleet at 660,000 vehicles um, and, and a wider population of another 1.4 million people that could take up the, that opportunity. So I think it's about the strategic placing of the money um, that, is, that is being used for one group of people specifically. Now it needs to be used for another group of people specifically. And to Sarah's point, yes, colorblind is an issue. Um, I'm yep. colorblind, I'm colorblind in, in a number of different ways. And I have a terrible time reading even ZapMap who have red things on a brown background or a black, black gray background. Can't read it, can't see it at all. Right, okay. Uh, sorry, we've got uh, one minute left and we've got Andy says he's still got his virtual hand up. So um, we're gonna put him on the spot and ask him what he thinks we should be doing or what he could be doing um, to support this agenda. Andrew, welcome to the EV Cafe. How are you doing, JB? Nice to speak to all of you. Great session as always. Um, I, my question was around community charging actually. So ra rather than me give some insight, I'd really like to get yours. Um, and it was around when you look at um, accessibility and uh, the amount of infrastructure that needs to, to be put out there to help all, I just wondered what part you thought community charging might play in that, because clearly that can deliver a lot more uh, access straight away from existing infrastructure, but I'm sure there's quite a few complications um, around that as well. So just really good to get your insight. Wow. Well, Sarah, we'll not have time to completely dissect it, but I'd say it needs more research and it has a place for now. <coughs> and I'm going to I'm going to be really stupid. Community charging. What is that? Using someone else's charger that isn't your own. So co-charger, the sort of co-charger approach. Or just park just, or any other. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. Exactly. Okay, brilliant. Love it. Absolutely love it. I think it's really, really important. That it's yet to really take off. I think that it's great in principle, but until we get people actually using it, I mean, Sam signed up for co-charger. I will uh, when my new charger goes in, but I'm not sure that there's a huge amount of usage just yet. And I think that's a missed opportunity. There's 
a hell of a lot of fear around it as well, like people having commercial vehicles on your uh, driveway permanently and being paid for it if you do it through Justify, which is quite cool. But yeah, a lot more research needed. Yeah, interesting. I'd, I'd agree. I, I think the same problem about what you do with vans on driveway, the space, the size, the look, there's, there's loads of things there, but certainly working in a company with a lot of vans that need to find a home to charge, um, ideally overnight, um, it's definitely a difficult thing to try and understand what you can do because on the street's not going to be the solution. Charging, unfortunately, um, on, the, on the go won't always be uh, the solution. So yeah. you could come on. I think the scary thing is, Andrew, that if there's a van on your drive, Paul Kirby's not far away. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great thing. Can I, John, can I just quickly jump back to Jamie, uh, who put breaking news out earlier. We didn't actually answer his question that we said earlier about, about what, his, what our thoughts were on fuel duty reduction. Um, uh, five, was it five pence a litre, I think he said? Yeah. Um, I assume that came out as we were on, on, on live. But yeah. um, my, my response to that would be, could we please have a VAT reduction on, on, uh, on energy costs as well, please, yes. uh, at, um, on public infrastructure? That would be a fair, a fair uh, trade-off, I think. In terms ben Maxwell says 5%, not 5p, Sam. 5%, not 5p, sorry. sorry so, yeah, hang on, let me just... R Rishi? Yeah, yeah, 5%. Yeah, there's, yeah. A, there's, a, there's a big difference between 5% and 5p as well, so thank you for pointing that out. But doesn't that just irritate the pants off you that government just thinks in straight lines? Let's all look at petrol and diesel because, ooh, that's a real problem. But they're not thinking mobility. They're not thinking how do we move around and that there is a large proportion of people who are signed up to a different way of powering their vehicles and they don't give a stuff. Yeah. Actually, that is the PM. Local councils are giving um, £150 energy rebate. Yeah. So that, that's coming, and obviously that will affect electric vehicle drivers. Not for everybody. Certain tax bans, isn't it? Right, that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid. So what can you do next? You can go onto our LinkedIn page, follow us, um, sign up to our YouTube account, and we'll make sure we get the videos out there in uh, hopefully by the by next week. And uh, what's on for the next session? When is our next session? Next session in April. But what, what's the date and what have we got? What are we going to talk about? It's terrible because oh. she's organised. I always know. We uh, the date is in I think it's the 20th of April, and it's looking at the shows to come. So we've got the commercial vehicle show and the ITT hub. So we'll be shining a light on what's happening there, and then we will pick a theme as well in addition to promoting the summer ahead before we go somebody asked a question about all of the information that's in the chat yeah. and there are lots of links and reports and information are we able to pull that out and and make that widely available oh i'm so glad you asked john because shortly following the recording i then summarize the show including the key messages from our guest speakers and then i go through the chat and find any shared links and post them in the comments of the posts on linkedin so we need to go to LinkedIn and scroll to the comments and you'll find the links that were shared in the chat today. We can't share the chat because we don't get permission at the start of the webinar to share the chat. Yeah. And thank you to the 50 who stayed with us the whole way through. Bless your heart. They're not. They've gone out. I mean. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. See you Thanks later. Thanks Adios. Bye-bye. Bye, Julian's mum. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>